My name is Molly Martin, and I'm the director of New America Indianapolis. New America is a nonpartisan, nonprofit think tank based in Washington, D.C., but home for me is Indiana, and I've lived in Indianapolis for almost 20 years. Uh, our part of New America focuses on how local communities respond to change and public problem solving, and this is the sixth in a series that we've done in partnership with the Indianapolis Recorder, one of the country's oldest and most respected Black newspapers. Today we're going to be discussing COVID-19 and its impact impact on Black workers. We know that the personal and economic disruptions of the virus and pandemic are challenging how all of us are living and making our living, but it is a unique challenge for the Black community, especially in Indianapolis and certainly in communities like it across the country. So I'm really excited today to be joined by Marshawn Wally of the Indianapolis Recorder and also our esteemed panel, Fred Payne, the Commissioner of the Indiana State Department of Workforce Development, Deputy Mayor Angela Smith-Jones of the City of Indianapolis, and she oversees economic development, and Angela Karklich, who is the President and CEO of Employee Indy. Uh, for those of you who are joining us from across the country, Employee Indy is our Workforce Development Board and actually serves a variety of roles that Angela will talk about a bit more later. Before we dive in, we always start every session in the COVID in the Black Community series by setting some ground rules. When New America Indianapolis talks about race and talks about the Black community, we follow a certain set of principles. First and foremost, that Black voices are critical and must be included in conversations about public policy, public problem solving, all conversations. Uh, systemic racism and biases impact every aspect of our personal, social, and economic lives, including our individual health. Black lives matter. Race and ethnicity are not the same. And the Black community is not a monolith. And when we talk about things like income and work and economic development, there are words we sometimes use like vulnerable or systemic, and we try to be really clear about those. That vulnerability often arises from systems and doesn't mean to imply any sort of weakness or, or flaw on the part of the community we're discussing. So with that, I want to thank all of you for coming. I uh, thank my partners at The Recorder, thank our design partners at InnoPower and our community partners at WFYI, and hand off to my co-moderator, Marshawn Wally, to say a little bit more. Marshawn? Thank you, Molly. Uh, last hired and first fired. Since 1972, large segments of decades, Black unemployment has been in the double digits. Black youth unemployment has been a perennial challenge. And while the Black-white uh, gap for Black unemployment has decreased in the last few years, the concerns have remained regarding both underemployment as well as even labor force participation rates by some economists. Gary Becker, a world-class Nobel laureate economist, famously argued that with perfect competition amongst companies, you would ultimately see an elimination of workforce discrimination. Well, perhaps we haven't had perfect competition yet. Uh, we still see discrimination in the labor markets, even when controlling for education. An October Bureau of Labor Statistics study found that white people with an associate's degree had a lower unemployment rate than black people with a college degree. And that black people with an associate's degree had a higher unemployment rate than white people with only a high school diploma. We have income gaps. We have who can telework and who can't. We have who is an essential worker. And if you want to advocate locally sometimes, it's difficult to get the data on black communities, particularly at a city level, maybe even at a neighborhood level. But before we get into all of this, what I'd like to do is get to know our panelists and the institutions that they work with. I'm actually gonna start with uh, our commissioner, Fred Payne. Uh, so uh, Department of Workforce Development, uh, Commissioner Payne, You've had a number of adjustments that you have made within your operation uh, recently. Uh, one area of concern actually had to do with black business owners who um, were by and large sole, sole proprietors and who became eligible for the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program. How's that program going? And are you able to track by race with that program? Well, Thanks, Marshawn, for the question, and uh, thanks for having me here today. Uh, first, I'd like to tell about the agency exactly what we do, and that'll put this in, into context. Our agency is the state's employment and reemployment agency. We have two primary focus areas. 
One is workforce operations, which we uh, ensure that folks uh, are getting workforce training and we're connecting people to workforce resources, job resources and career resources. And we're connecting uh, employers to uh, people who have the skills that they desire. The other half of the house is dedicated to administering the uh, unemployment insurance trust fund. And as we all know, right now we are uh, seeing extreme numbers of unemployment insurance being filed across the nation. Indiana is, is no different. And we have uh, implemented several federal programs uh, that Congress has laid out. One of them is the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program uh, that Marshawn uh, uh, just referenced. That program is an entirely new program uh, set aside for uh, those individuals who are independent contractors, those who are self-employed, individuals who may not have had a sufficient work history uh, or benefits uh, that have accumulated long enough to allow them to be eligible for state unemployment insurance benefits. This was a completely new program. And if those who are really into how the unemployment insurance system works, this is an entirely new classification of workers who were never uh, given unemployment benefits before. So Indiana, along with other states, had to build a completely new infrastructure to take in these applications. Just on May 8th, uh, we started uh, actually paying out uh, under the Pandemic Unemployment Insurance Program. We had about 68,000 uh, people who filed under that program. And as of last week, we had paid about 60,000 of those. Under the program, individuals' uh, tax returns and income data is evaluated, and they end up getting a payment based upon uh, the earnings. That's one part of it. But then the other part of the payment is an automatic $600 payment on top of whatever that calculated amount is. So for example, if the calculated amount which could be no more than $390 uh, a week. If it's $200, then that person would end up getting the $200. And then on top of that, they'll get $600. So they could be eligible for up to $800 a week in that scenario. That $600 will go through the end of July. So now to your direct question on how is that program going? As I mentioned earlier, uh, we ended up started making payments on the program uh, on May 8th, uh, 60,000 of the 68,000 have been paid. Uh, we are working right now on the retroactive payments because as a part of the CARES Act, uh, those payments are retroactive back uh, to the last part of March. So an individual is asked when they apply for pandemic unemployment, when did they get impacted by it? And if it goes back beyond uh, March, they'll end up getting retro payments back until you know the date uh, of the last part of March, early uh, April. So we're in the process now of actually sort of starting to disaggregate some of that data. Uh, we don't have that data right now because the program is so new. We don't have that uh, disaggregated down to uh, male, female, race, uh, and things like that just yet. So that's kind of one of those next stages after we get beyond uh, the payments getting distributed to individuals. That's, that's good to know. So it is a very new program. Uh, I remember watching some of the, the almost daily updates that you all have been participating in and talking about, you know, trying to build a website on the fly with new rules coming that you know, might be changing even even as we speak. Uh, I want to move to Deputy Mayor Angela Smith. Uh, Deputy Mayor Angela Smith Jones, you have a very interesting job. Most people don't um, grow up and say, "Hey, I want to be a Deputy Mayor for Economic Development." So, can you kind of describe, you know, what your role is in this space and help us understand? Um, you know, we were we were on a hot streak, really. We we were doing really really well. Um, can you get us, kind of give us a, a, a taste of what we're seeing now uh, due to COVID-19 and, and kind of, you know, what you're seeing? 
Yes, so uh, thank you so much for having me to join this esteemed panel. I'm uh, fortunate enough to work with Angie Karklich and Commissioner Fred, Kamane, uh, Fred Payne on a regular basis, and so I'm thrilled to be able to share this opportunity with them. So as you had indicated, you're right, no one grows up thinking they're going to be deputy mayor. I'm extremely fortunate to have been chosen by our mayor, Joe Hogsett, um, to really oversee not only economic development, but our workforce space and also our um, minority and women uh, disabled and veteran owned businesses, as well as international affairs and Latino affairs for the city. So just the intersectionality of every human being and how we are able to sustain ourselves is my role. Um, just for the record, I am an attorney um, by training and trade. I'm licensed and um, I think that also kind of helps uh, one, the mayor selecting me, and two, and understanding some of the strange uh, things that are occurring now in our time and our economy. Um, so the city of Indianapolis, to Marshawn's point, we've been doing very well um, under the leadership of CEO Carr Klitsch. Um, we've done a lot of transitioning and how do we do under identify and understand who in our community is most vulnerable. Then through one of my other entities, which is Develop Indy, we've been working very closely in understanding what are some of the gaps? Where are opportunities for those who have historically been marginalized and disenfranchised and left out of our economies? And then partnering with our Office of Minority and Women in Business Development, we've been able to work on what is called a disparity study. So actually doing a deep dive into clearly understanding what are those gaps? Do they exist? What do they look like? Who's being most greatly impacted? And then going back into where we are now, how do we look at the facts and the data that we've been able to gain and gather? And how do we start to create policies to really have a positive impact on the economy as a whole, and most specifically on those who are most greatly impacted by lack of opportunity um, and policies that have historically left us out, uh, be it intentionally or unintentionally. And so having that solid background of a strong economy, we really, in Indianapolis, we've been named several times in the top five and two of the cities that have a very strong e-commerce business and um, economy and ecosystem. Also a great city for star um, startups. Fast Company just named us in the top five for a great startup city and foundation in that space. And so when you look at the strength of from where we've come to now and being able to look at our vulnerabilities that were identified during that disparity study are apparent and out in the front. We really are being able to see how many of our small vulnerable companies are sole proprietors and needing to take advantage of the pandemic assistance. And the fear and anxiety of the black and Hispanic business owners who are so accustomed to hearing no and having to fight for everything, not really believing or understanding that that is available for them as a sole proprietor. And so I've had to spend a lot of time talking in webinars explaining, please apply, you really do qualify. And the gap is somewhat recognized, so you have to apply in order to be able to take advantage of these opportunities. And then I'll get in a little more on some very creative solutions that the city in partnership with the ND Chamber and some other key strong community partners have been working to ensure that we're continuing to support our small businesses um, from sole proprietor to 150 employees and ensuring that they're able to keep their doors open during these times so that we can restart our economy going forward. So thank you very much for that opportunity, Marshawn. Yeah, and, um, and Angela, I know um, we've talked about this in the past, the numbers, the numbers of workers filing for unemployment has been, it, it's been a dramatic increase, almost around tenfold. That's, that, is that continuing to kind of move like that? Are we still seeing um, our unemployment filing those numbers? for the city kind of moving? Yes, I, I wasn't sure which Angela you meant. <laughs> so sorry, yes, the numbers have grown exponentially and as, as uh, Car Angie Carklich and Commissioner Payne will be able to clearly indicate, it is greatly impacting our black and Hispanic communities. Um, and it is statistical that 
our wealth gap when you look at generational wealth, current net worth between the black and Hispanic and the white communities is dramatic. It's like 10% gap between black and whites. Their average net worth is like 171,000 for a white family, but only 17,000 for a white family. And then it's 8% gap um, between black and Hispanic um, to the white community. So when you look at that, you can see how critically important it is for us to be able to take advantage of these opportunities because we're going to fall through those cracks so much quicker and not have an opportunity to regain what we've lost. It, it's statistical that we have to earn two to three times more income than the average white um, employee just to even stay on par. That does not take into account any inheritance. That does not take into account any family wealth where the house is already owned so you don't have a mortgage or your vehicle is already owned so you don't have a car note. So even if we're making the appropriate amount of income, we still have greater expenses. Student loan, the rate of student loans is so much more dramatic. 74% of blacks take out student loans and less than uh, right around 50% of whites, but then the repayment component, right? If you have nothing else to pay but your student loans, it's different than when you have all of those other factors, which I just indicated. So all of that unemployment, the lower income rates have a greater impact on the black and Hispanic community. Um, and so therefore it pushes us further behind Behind when we're already starting behind. So we, so in the black community, it's fair to say, uh, in the black and even the Latinx community, it's fair to say that um, in Indianapolis, we are facing some of the challenges that you see in other communities across the country. I'm going to go to Angela uh, Carr Klitsch. So um, Employ Indy, it is our workforce uh, institution. Can you talk about what Employ Indy does? And um, I went and, and learned, learning more about Employee Indy, you all went through a process for identifying like where you were going to work and, and, and really focusing on vulnerable uh, communities. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and, and your approach to your work? Definitely, I'd be pleased to. And thanks to the Indianapolis Recorder and New America for these series of conversations. Um, they've been incredibly insightful and I'm glad to participate here today. So as uh, you mentioned and Molly did as well at the top of the hour, Employee Indy is the Workforce Development Board for Marion County. Um, and really uh, to synthesize what we do, we, we're a matchmaker between supply and demand. So um, what is imperative to know is that depending on what the labor market looks like and what demand exists and where supply chains are being educated and trained from, um, there's a gap between those two activities and so are to those two stakeholders. So um, when I was appointed by the mayor uh, in June of 2016, we felt like it was very important to reevaluate uh, the mission and the efforts that were existent at Employee Indy and retrofit the organization for the realities of what the labor market was. This was not immediately after 2008. Um, and while we had incredibly low unemployment for Marion County as a whole, the reality is that those numbers were really um, taking away from the story that exists at the neighborhood level and at the zip code level. Um, and so through our strategic planning process, we really identified three high level objectives that we want the community to hold us accountable for. One is that we want employers to find the talent that they need to continue to undergird our economy. And uh, in the previous economy that we were working under, uh, those employers were really hungry for that talent, were willing to participate more fully in cultivating and training that talent. Um, and we could have conversations with them about ways to create uh, an environment within the office themselves, within the company itself that would be more inviting, uh, ways for those companies to participate more fully in training um, that would result in you know, an employee that had not only the employability skills, but also the occupational skills necessary. Um, our second high level objective was really to create a positive trajectory for youth and young adults. Uh, that young population was disproportionately affected after 2008, particularly our young black and brown uh, peoples. And Unfortunately, uh, that never recovered. And so what we have is a number of 
young people, 16 to 24 years old, who not only are not participating in the labor market nor in education, but they've given up hope. And so we felt like it was really important for us to work collectively with our partners to recognize that and to be more intentional in our efforts of offering work-based learning experiences and the requisite social supports for those young people. And in Marion County, uh, our data shows there's about 30,000 of those opportunity youth. So they're not being served through those traditional systems. So we need to do something to, to capture them, uh, build rapport and trust, frankly, because that's a prerequisite before you can even have a conversation about skills development or employment. And then finally, to your earlier point, uh, we recognize that um, with not a lot of funding and not a lot of resources, there's never enough money to serve really the needs. We needed to be more judicious of where we invested these dollars and what partners we work with. So we identified five zip codes here in Marion County that had a disproportionate number of people who were under underemployed and probably more distressing to me um, that were not participating in the labor force. So again, we get back to that hope gap issue. Um, and I don't think it will come as a surprise to you or to others on this call that those zip codes have a preponderance of individuals who are people of color. Um, one of our zip codes alone, uh, 46235, 58% of the population there is African American, 25% of them are not participating in the labor force. So a lot of the issues um, that are really uh, emerging right now were pre-existing. The inequalities that, uh, that were here um, are now being exacerbated uh, due to COVID-19. It is um, very important that you all have decided to really focus on some areas and to really kind of see if you can get uh, movement as opposed to spreading resources across, you know, a large county. And so I very much appreciate that. Uh, at this point, I would like to, to turn it over to Molly because uh, I know she has some questions. Sure. Thank you, Marshawn. One of the things that, that I find so moving and really heartening about having the three of you on is this is not news to you. No one is saying, no way. You, you understand that the disparities that pre-existed COVID have just been amplified, as Angie just said. One other thing that you all touched on and falls a little bit outside of your agency and organization's charges is that job for what? Right? We, we assume that we work for purpose, but we also, frankly, we work for income and we work to be able to get by. And in Indiana, no one makes less than black women and Latinx women. And, and black men make a lot less than white men. You know, the gap isn't yet, isn't 20,000, but it's, it's inching that way. So I, I'd like to come to each of you and hear a little bit about your take on wage inequity. When you're trying to encourage folks to take a chance and re-enter that social contract and re-enter the workforce and maybe obtain education and training. Um, what would you say to them about the gap, the wage gap that they're going to find? And what would you say to your colleagues across the country about battling that wage gap from a workforce development standpoint? Commissioner Payne, I'm going to, I'm going to come to you first. I think that's a, that's a very good question. And, and it's something that quite frankly, has come up a lot. I've been in this role for about two and a half years now. And one of the things that we wanted to focus on when I initially came in was to uh, make sure that we looked at equity across all of our programs to ensure that we had equity in program distribution and equity in who actually was participating uh, in those programs. One of the things that we found is that uh, people receive information differently. That, that was not news, right? But the way that we distribute uh, information and awareness about uh, what resources are available may not necessarily get down to the level of the person who is at a, a certain zip code. There may be uh, individuals who are privy to listening to uh, maybe uh, a chamber or who's a member of a certain um, organization because information is freely uh, there because that's the the majority of the media market. So we tried to make sure that we were more targeted on where we were providing information uh, so that more people can understand what resources are available. And what we've also found is that when we shared more information and more resources, uh, more discussions came around the inequities that we do have, not only in uh, income, but actually in outcomes uh, for some of the programs. 
So which is why we've tried to come up with an approach that focuses on the person as opposed to a program. Programs are great, we need programs, but if the programs aren't centered around the person, then we may miss a little bit. And individuals don't have the hope that they need to really engage in the program. So for example, much of this uh, from an individual perspective, you know, boils down to well, how is it going to benefit me if I've already uh, engaged in a certification program and I am not receiving a salary or a wage that I think is appropriate for the certification that I have, then what incentive do I have to get another one or to keep trying? Well, part of what we want to do is to make sure that we are showing the difference between certifications because all certifications aren't the same um, but those that have value we want to focus on those but we also want to focus on the individual and his or her situation because uh, you can take two individuals who have the same type of certification but they're making different wages because their circumstances may be different one may have more experience than the other but by and large what we're trying to do is to make sure that People understand what resources are available. We are being a little bit more intentional about where we focus our time and attention and making sure that we also recognize that different certifications, different skills and educational levels will generally yield uh, different types of income, but those things don't necessarily equal the same thing for all people. So part of it is being really intentional and that's what our agency is trying to do. And when we have conversations with even my colleagues across the country and some of my counterparts, uh, we have these conversations. Uh, part of it really is an awareness issue, but here at the state level, what we focused on and particularly in what we call a strategic plan is sort of a plan that the state has to put together uh, based upon uh, some, of the, some of the federal guidelines that we follow. We've been more strategic about this plan to make it more people focused as opposed to programmatic uh, focused. And that program, I mean, that, um, that strategic plan uh, was just uh, put into place and finalized actually uh, within the last couple of months. I really appreciate that, Commissioner. I think the idea that this is, we're not program poor in Indiana. Uh, but we still find these disparities. So I think that's a, a wonderful tack. Before I, before I leave you on this, Commissioner Payne, uh, you've talked about focusing on the person. Have you talked at the state level at all about practices like name, bl name blind hiring? You know, we've heard from folks around the state and some smaller projects we've done that, uh, you know, obviously systemic racism is something we're still grappling with and, and putting folks into programs may not get them over the hurdle in certain industries that don't have a culture of, of and a history of, of hiring racially diverse folks. Has that sort of come up? Has that sort of topic come up? Yeah, it, in, in by and large, it, it does when we really get down to the sort of the grassroots conversations when we talk directly with employers. Um, because we have employers who uh, talk to us about really having the desire and really wanting to have something effective to reach all demographics. And by and large, employers are recognizing that if they don't do something differently, then they're not going to be as marketable as some of the other companies that are. So those things do come up. And we also have an organization uh, here uh, that really uh, came aboard within the past couple of years, uh, Skillful in Indiana. And part of their approach really is to look at uh, job resumes and really to become really more skilled focused as opposed to, well, you need this degree, you need that degree. They look more at the skills base. So that's an example of really getting to what employers really need. So when it comes to things like um, systemic things that may kind of push a person outside of, you know, being considered for a job, that's one. You, you look at the resume overall, but you also look at some of the name recognition on a resume too. Some of those things uh, have come up. And one of the things that we know that we can't do, um, we all have biases, just the reality is that we all have biases and there are different studies that we can cite to. Each person has about 150 to 200 biases, give or take, okay? That's a big range. What we can do with bias 
is that we can create processes that eliminate bias from the process. That doesn't necessarily mean you eliminate the bias from the person, but what you've done is you've put more of a guarantee in place to ensure that there isn't bias in the process. And by and large, the employers that we talk to uh, have been working on trying to eliminate bias from their processes. Thank you, that's so helpful, Commissioner. Um, President Karklich, and Angie of Employee Indy, since we're differentiating our Angelas, uh, you obviously toe that line between employer needs and resident needs. And, and when you're thinking about everything the commissioner just said and thinking about how to make this value proposition, when your workers may be well aware, your clients may be well aware that, that what they're getting isn't what they were wanting. Um, how do you manage that? How do you balance that? Sure. I mean, I obviously there is the supply side, right? And that's a crude term to talk about our residents. But, you know, there is a, you know, there is a responsibility of an individual to understand what their interest areas are and then what they're good at. And then there's a responsibility of a system like our government uh, and or private sector partners to to recognize what labor market looks demand looks like and translate that information so that consumers, especially those who maybe are basic skills deficient or digitally illiterate, have the ability to use that information to make informed choices. And that will not that kind of seamless flywheel will not happen without some human capital as well. So some career navigators that can help guide. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only one that's on this conversation, that's participating in this conversation that, but without my parents, I don't know what my navigation would look like because it's not something that necessarily was subsidized through other parts of my schooling or anything like that, right? So there is a responsibility for us in that respect, um, and there's a responsibility on the consumer. I would argue in this moment, especially, that there's a responsibility on the part of employers and on the demand side. So in recent years, we've adopted a, a Brookings study that talked about good and promising jobs. And that equates to about $18 an hour here in Marion County with benefits. Um, there were few jobs that emerged post-2008 to come back from the recession that met that threshold, that met that criteria. And so it's a in my, in my opinion, we have to have the same conversation with employers that we do with individuals about what, what is a good job, what is a career ladder and uh, an opportunity, and what are some internal practices that can be adopted that make the environment welcoming, safe, but also try to reduce biases as uh, the commissioner mentioned as well. Excellent, such an important point, uh, kind of doubling down on the idea that you are engineering for the system, knowing full well what people are up against. So coming to you, Deputy Mayor Smith-Jones, same question, same reflection. This is a, a hard time to make a value proposition when people are, are having trouble even meeting basic needs. How do you do it? So I, I've been like taking notes and thinking it's so much in my mind. I'm like, I could actually talk about this for probably an hour. Um, but my friend Angie Karklich actually kind of hit on some of what I wanted to really, and you said if I'm speaking to other deputy mayors of economic development across the country, um, what I would say is the most important thing to do is partner with institutions who will help you do a deep dive into the data on what does your community really look like. Um, municipalities are actually fun Funded by income taxes prim primarily and secondarily property taxes. So if you look at the makeup of your community and you're realizing that you have a high population of um, Black and Latinx um, uh, residents, and then you look at the average income of what's coming in, then really it's a win-win if you figure out how do we help our residents identify opportunities to get the necessary training and experience to be able to take advantage of good and promising jobs, because that's what I was going to talk about. In Indiana, there's less than a 4% chance that you will make it from the lowest quartile into the highest quartile of income earners. That's very disparaging, that's very sad, and it actually will kind of make you hopeless unless you get an opportunity for the city to take the lead and work with some really strong partners as employee Indy, as the Indy Chamber, and kind of say, okay, look, what are some of the sectors where you really can get what's called a good job? So it pays a good wage of $18. What are the sectors in the industries where they are opening their minds up to true diversity and true inclusion in their um, 
environments and where are their opportunities that when you start out with that good job, they actually want you to grow and progress within that corporate environment or within that sector. Even if it's one employer is typically the lower end of the income, then you switch to another employer when you get additional training and experience and then another employer, but they're all in the same sector. They're building upon similar skill sets and it's an opportunity for you to get in and move up and then gain, really make gains on that net worth that those in the black and brown community were typically missing. And so I know our city, we have done just that. And so we're still looking at, as Angie actually clearly indicated, those navigators, those touch points. And Fred had said, how do you find the people in our community who are out of all of the systems? How do you give them hope? How do you build trust? And how do you, at the same time, because this is a part of my job, is to work with CEOs all the time and say, hey, kind of share with me what your policies and procedures are with diversity and inclusion from someone with who got kicked out of high school, an ex-offender, somebody who speaks a different language, they pray a different way. Are you really open to having a true diverse community? And one of my favorite quotes, which is incumbent on the employer, is not only embracing people who are different, but realizing that the employer has an obligation to pour into their teams and to ensure that their teams develop. I know at the end of the day, it's about profit, but your profit is magnified when you are investing in people and who they are. And one of my favorite quotes, a friend from Indianapolis, from IUPUI University said, employers have to realize that no one is getting a fully baked cake. So when you get talent, it's not a fully baked cake, already cooled, ready to put icing on. You got to put it in the oven and finish baking it. So that's training, development, income, making sure you're providing the basic um, needs that surround, you know, benefits, et cetera, so that when you are obtaining that fantastic talent, you honor their diversity, whatever that is, and then you also realize whomever this person is, they're going to still need a little bit of training and investment on our, from the employer side to ensure that that person reaches their greatest potential and that pays back that ROI to the company is that the company is solid and they're able to grow and develop and increase their profitability. So it real, there's a lot of work for deputy mayors to do, but I'm telling you, you can do it if you've got some strong key partners and you're willing to partner and really forge an opportunity for those most vulnerable in your city. Fantastic, thank you so much. Marshawn, I'm confident that you have a follow-up question to that, I can see it. Yes, yes, so um, actually what I wanted to do is uh, go to uh, Commissioner Payne um, at one point, black unemployment, well, Indiana was, was one of the 14 states where the black unemployment rate was higher than the white unemployment rate. Um, I want to, and I also know that the state developed a workforce strategy that integrated, you know, education with, with labor, with, with the labor strategy. And I wanted you to kind of talk about that and, and how you all are look, like looking at the data on you know who's being uh, who's unemployed and, and 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 what that looks like from an education perspective. Okay, I think that good question is an important point because we this goes back to what I said about being people focused and being really intentional. And part of the things that that, that we look at uh, when we're talking about uh, an employ a really good environment where you have. Uh, employers who are really looking for employees and who are thriving, who are interested in bringing in and having the whole person show up, meaning all of their diversity, uh, having that person show up. What you're looking at then is the resources that we have at the state level that's sort of incentivizing that. Uh, we have a variety of uh, programs that we've looked, but we've tried to make them people-centric. and. We have uh, two things in place with the Employer Training Grant Program and our Workforce Ready Grant Program. Uh, those are programs that really defray the cost of training for both an employer and an individual. If an individual uh, finds a, a skill or some type of job or certification that they aren't, they don't have the skills and abilities to do just yet, uh, we pay for that uh, almost 100% uh, most of the time. Uh, say, for example, if a person wants to go into uh, computer coding, uh, because those jobs may yield a higher income and, and better career path for them. 
the person goes to our um, uh, training provider list, they find someone who provides that training and then they go get the training. But what we have done in terms of that is we, we made a direct focus on um, direct interaction and engagement with uh, women owned, uh, minority owned, veterans owned uh, businesses and trainers and, and companies and try to make sure that we were focusing attention and awareness uh, to those organizations to help make sure that we do have a diverse group of employers but we also have a group of employers that's interested in and who are committed uh, to diversity. Uh, and getting kind of off, off that topic just a little bit uh, in what we've seen in terms of just uh, attainment level for college, uh, these are kind of two different things because one of them ties into the skills that a person has to go on and to get a job and to be successful in that job. This other piece is more the resources that are available to an individual who has chosen the college track or who has chosen to go from school to work and what, what's available to them. So just for example, uh, those individuals who wanted to graduate from high school and go to college. Uh, in the most recent equity report or college readiness report from the Commission for Higher Ed, black students uh, graduating and enrolling in college uh, did so at 53%. 53% of high school graduates uh, enrolled in college. Compare that to 61% for all students. That's the average. The on-time college completion uh, for black students is about 26%. But all students, the average is about 47%. So we see there's still a, a little gap. For that extended time, uh, for completion of college, essentially that goes to about six years. Um, black students make up about 35% of that. All students is about 62% uh, of that. So you see the rate in which um, black students are going to college, there's still a big gap, okay? Part of that gap uh, has something to do with resources, which is why there have been a variety of um, financial aid programs around the state that have helped to uh, offset that with the 21st Century Scholars Program uh, being one of them. So we see education and we see resources as a big part uh, of the equation, but we also see it goes back again to what I said earlier. It's awareness. There are many people who are just unaware that these resources are available. And that is why one of our primary focuses has been making sure that we get the awareness to populations that may not have gotten this awareness uh, before or that they get awareness through different channels than our mainstream channels. So that's sort of the shift that we've made over the past couple of years really is getting out to the communities, having discussions like this is ever so important, but the discussion can't end with just this discussion. There has to be some kind of uh, action to it. And that's why we go behind um, each one of these conversations that we have and provide resources. We're in the process now of working with a group of individuals of what we call our rapid recovery team. And we are putting together resources. Um, we're gonna roll it out here in a few weeks. Uh, resources to ensure that folks who are trying to get out of COVID-19, that we have those resources available, which will include uh, free or reduced college tuition or cost uh, for them, or uh, free certifications for them. Uh, because we know leading, coming out of this pandemic, people are gonna need some help. And one of the things that we've looked at in terms of who we need to uh, look at, uh, when we look at the folks who've been unemployed, who filed for unemployment over the past month, about 233,000 claims filed between uh, March 15th and April 15th. Here's sort of the educational level of those folks who are out of work. 7% have less than a high school education. 7% of those who are unemployed right now have uh, a high, less than a high school education. 41% have a high school education. But the other 48%, they have some college. 
meaning they have, uh, they've gone and taken a college course all the way up to uh, graduating from college. So when you look at that data, it's almost half and half when it comes to college and non-college. But the interesting statistic there is the 7% of high school folks uh, with less than high school uh, education who are unemployed. General, the general wisdom would say that there would be more of those individuals right now who are out of work. But what we're seeing is that those are individuals who are in the jobs that are at the grocery stores. Uh, those individuals are working because they, they have to go to work. Those are some essential services. But by and large, the individuals who are filling those jobs uh, don't have uh, the education that uh, someone has who would uh, have a job that would allow them to work remotely. And I know I probably gave you a little bit more than you asked there. That was actually perfect. Uh, you actually brought up the, the challenge of the essential workers as well. That has been um, one of the disparities that we've seen where someone has to go to work and potentially risk exposure to COVID-19. Um, and a lot of those folks, you know, uh, were in lower paying jobs and they were black and brown people. And so that, that's had um, an impact on, you know, some of the disparities that we've seen probably in both the testing um, and, and hopefully not the deaths, but probably the deaths as well. I wanna go to uh, Angela Clark Klitsch uh, real quick and ask, um, in, in your work, when you're looking at um, like education and skills and, and um, you know, just the kind of the cultural capital, social capital that um, folks in your communities and the communities that you're working in, um, what are you seeing? Are, you know, what, what, what kind of information are you trying to um, react to, respond to, and address in the work that you're doing? Sure. Um, well, again, right now, it's obviously a moment of crisis, right? Um, and I think our lens needs to be as, you know, the agency charged with a lot of reemployment of our residents here in Marion County of recognizing what new demand looks like. So understanding what surge occupations are going to come about as a result of um, this disaster recovery, um, and it's a different type of disaster than our country has ever experienced before. You know, usually those funds coming from the federal government are utilized for cleaning up after an earthquake or a hurricane. Um, what does that look like post-COVID? But then ultimately, we also need to be working with our private sector partners to understand what new product lines are being developed and what demand looks like. That's always been a challenge. Label market information is a lagging uh, data point for us. Um, so, um, is that Winston Churchill never let a good crisis go to waste. What can we do to create a virtuous flywheel of information transmittal from the, the private sector as well as other employers in our community? And obviously in Marion County, we have a significant government uh, employees and we also have nonprofit employees as well, but understand more fully what those opportunities are and then build back from that demand understanding the existing training programs that uh, can be modified almost immediately to go online too, because I believe that we will continue to have some uh, restrictions on the numbers being able to congregate at one time. So those are really important. What I will say is that we have to stay the path that we divide, decided on um, as an, at Employee Indy a number of years ago. There are still 80,000 people in Marion County without a high school equivalency. So that continues to be uh, you know, a way that we invest and emphasize our efforts because it's really hard to train them for other opportunities if you don't have that baseline foundational skill set. So in, in some respects, I'm, I, I'm heartened that we decided on this course of action a number of years ago. Obviously the scale and magnitude of the challenge is overwhelming, um, but we have a lot of the infrastructure in place to uh, continue to, to lift up and serve our community who again has you know, been disproportionately affected by uh, the recovery since 2008. And, um, you know, some of the programs, and now I'm going to go to uh, Deputy Mayor Angela Smith-Jones. Uh, you mentioned some of the, uh, Angela Clark Klitsch mentioned um, some of the programs that we put in place to try to uh, address the, really what sounds like the racial achievement gap and the opportunity gap and getting folks up to speed and, and, and trained. Uh, one of the interesting programs that's come into play, and you mentioned this earlier, was the $18 an hour wage 
uh, proposal that was connected to new projects. Now, obviously, um, I don't know what new projects look like right now, but can you explain kind of the, the thought process behind that and how in any other programs that um, the city is using currently to kind of impact or where black people can benefit um, from those? Thanks. Uh, absolutely, and thank you for the opportunity to highlight that, um, Marshawn. So um, through the work of the city under the leadership of the mayor, we've been actually um, really focusing on what's called inclusive growth. So from the studies that have been done since 2016 until most recently, including that disparity study, we've learned that in order to really have a completely inclusive economy, you really have to pay a sustaining wage so that people do not continue to need to rely upon the governmental based systems, but they are able to take care of themselves. So that would be an $18 an hour uh, wage floor, also including benefits within that. And then the other components of that, which we've come to realize are critically important in supporting the workforce and the talent and the residents in our city is how do you add additional supports to that, right? So whether it's child, um, child care services and or transit services and opportunities, how do you really create a full package? If you would like to ask for incentives and support from the city, we are looking at this completely inclusive growth package before we say yes, right? We want to encourage corporations to broaden their minds and really fully embrace what is out there. When you look at the child care component and the transit component, what we're asking employers to do is to invest that 5%, approximately 5% of the full incentive that you're getting from the city, right? So if it's $100, you're investing $5, right? Towards a community benefit. So are there opportunities within our city where you can either pay for additional transit, whether it's paying for a transit pass for your employee or infrastructure by partnering with Indigo? How do you assist with childcare? Um, earlier, Molly had indicated that the lowest paid um, employees typically are black and Hispanic women. And then typically we're single moms. So when you look at that, there are many gaps that exist that an employer, if they invest in that, they're actually getting a great ROI because their employees are able to come to work via transit or come to work because they have adequate um, childcare and they also have benefits. So they're able to keep their health um, you know, in a good in a good place, which addresses the health disparities, which we know exist. So that's one of the key components that we're doing and looking at city incentives and how we offer them. Um, we'd also kind of talked about businesses, right, and small business. So another component of that is if you are a small business, an XBE business, we've been able to look at how do we come alongside and uh, through this disparity study, we've been able to realize all of this. What are some of the greatest gaps and opportunities for a city to come and support a small business XBE business, right? And what the, what the findings were is that the greatest gap is the operational funding, right? That at the end of the day, because when you look at our average net wealth, it, net worth, excuse me, it is so low that it is extremely difficult to float any of that timeline of waiting to be paid through a contract, right? So in partnership with one of our key organizations in the city, the ND Chamber, we were able to create a program that we're calling the GAP program, right? And gap means many things, <laughs> but at the end of the day, it's an opportunity that when you are sole proprietor, especially in XBE, you are able to work together with the prime contractor, take advantage of the contract that you have signed, get some gap funding, which stands in the gap of while you're really still providing services, still having to buy supplies, still having to pay employees, but have not yet been able to receive any payment through the invoicing system, right? How do you survive during that time until you're actually being able to be paid? So we have a new program that works with sole proprietors and small businesses to that effect. So that's two separate sides of the coin, but two different strong programs that are working to really ensure that those who are typically left out are getting an opportunity to not only sustain, but start to advance. Yeah, it sounds like um, knowing the disparities and understanding even the disparities from the business side has really helped you think about um, workers and their and the position that they find themselves in. At this point, I'd like to um, 
hand it over to Molly uh, as we kind of, I, I think we're, let her, let her ask her questions and we move forward with the program. Sure, sure. Um, and uh, thanks to everyone who's asking questions in the chat. We have about a, a half hour more together and we'll be working those questions in. And, and you were just talking about disparities and how recognizing them and naming them means that you can address them. Uh, we've had a great question in the chat about persistent disparities. Uh, we talked a little bit about the, per, the disparities across the lowest paid swath of, of our workforce uh, and among our neighbors. But disparities also persist for folks who have a college education. And the commissioner talked about just how many people with some college or even a degree are unemployed right now. And so Commissioner Payne, when you think of a, let's say a black resident who has a college education, has found themselves unemployed, perhaps because they are an entrepreneur or maybe they're in one of the hardest hit sectors, what would you tell them? Like, it's just, it's just you, Fred, and, resident Molly, and she said, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to start. I did everything right. Where would you tell them to go? A couple of places. Uh, first, uh, on the, uh, I've done everything right. Uh, COVID-19 has changed everything. Uh, right now, there are a lot of people who are out of work who did everything right. Um, so that position right now, it really isn't an uncommon position, particularly uh, it's not an uncommon position for a person of color. So a couple of places I would tell them to go because there are different reasons why I would have them to go. So first off, take advantage of the temporary programs that are in place right now. Uh, as Marshawn introduced earlier, the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program. Right now, that program is available to a group of individuals uh, that were never contemplated for unemployment insurance uh, of benefits. Take advantage of that right now. Secondly, utilize that network. That network that uh, we have and sometimes we don't really want to tap into it, now is the time to tap into that network because believe it or not, we still have over 100,000 jobs in Indiana that are open right now. Many of those jobs are remote jobs. So the person's job or the person's um, a company or their uh, business right now may have been sidelined because of COVID-19, but there are a lot of other opportunities that are available right now. So I would say take advantage of those. So I would go to a few places. Uh, one, uh, you know, go to our unemployment insurance website uh, to do that for pandemic unemployment insurance take advantage of that because the uh, $600 portion of it, which makes up the bulk of that weekly amount, it's going to run out. It has an expiration date uh, of the end of July. Uh, now, Congress is contemplating more, but as it stands right now, July 31st is when that additional $600 runs out, but the program will run through the end of December of this year. Tap into the network but also utilize this time because the person may be uh, unemployed right now, may be sidelined. Uh, think of opportunities or things that they wanted to do before that they didn't have time to do. For example, if the individual is running uh, you know, a certain kind of business and there was another certification that they wanted to get, but they didn't have the time to do it because they were running their business, now may be a very good time to do that. And this is an opportunity right now where there are resources available to help pay for some of those certifications. So my advice would be twofold. One, take advantage of the short-term opportunities that are there, and then take advantage uh, of the network that's in place. Thank you so much. And I think uh, you hit on something really important that this, this can be an opportunity and that we are lucky in Indiana and that we had a, a surfeit, a real history of black excellence. Right? And, and the opportunity to celebrate uh, what is our legacy in this region, which is kind of the, the success of the African American middle class. And we talk, I, I use the words kind of doing everything right, but we know in this country you can do all the things right and still not get what you, what you deserve, what we all deserve. And, and to that point, we have a, a group, a large group of hardworking people in Indianapolis, uh, 50,000 or more working in hospitality. They make our economy go and they are taking a huge hit right now. And, and with those 50,000 folks getting news like the news we got today that Gen Con is not coming in August and that these mammoth 
hospitality opportunities are, are delayed. Um, what would you say, Angie Karklich at Employee Indie, to someone who is thinking of making a transition from that hospitality industry? Indianapolis needs its hospitality folks, but I'm not sure we can ask someone to put their life on hold. Would you have any advice for, for folks who are in, experiencing just kind of hit after hit right now? Sure. I think I would, um, you know, reiterate Commissioner Payne's comments that, you know, there are opportunities out there right now, right? So not only that are about reemployment, but are also about training so that if you wanted to career change, this could be an opportune time. Um, I, I do think that we need to uh, respect kind of a grieving process that happens. Our, our identity is so tied into um, our work, uh, our experience with the carrier dislocation, you could build up as many programs and they could be funded, but people have to be ready to, to take advantage of those. And we're kind of in the tyranny of the moment right now. So I just want to um, reflect that back out to, to understand that while these opportunities can exist, people have to be in the right headspace to be able to take advantage of that. Um, there also are challenges around connectivity because right now, as we well know, you can't really access a public library or the work one system. Um, other than through a virtual capacity. And if you don't have access to those software or hardware resources, that is a challenge. Um, that being said, you know, there are amazing skill sets for individuals who's been, who have been serving in the hospitality industry. The customer service um, aspect is bar none. And in fact, um, we are doing our due diligence to understand, again, labor market demand, and then build back into kind of uh, client profiles where someone can envision themselves in that opportunity. A perfect example is the city of Indianapolis is looking to hire 100 new police officers. And when they go through to look at the characteristics, they really are interested in trying to target bartenders who have lost or been displaced due to COVID, given that they have a skill set of de-escalating situations, et cetera. We are now trying to call the existing data on the supply side to understand who has been dislocated from those occupations and can we be more intentional and curate information around new opportunities that match actually some skill sets that they already have. If you can't see it, you can't be it. And so we really have to let individuals envision themselves in these new opportunities and then come alongside with the fiscal resources to support that. Um, and not just the training itself, but to support uh, themselves and their families as they retrain too. That's always been the chicken and egg, even in the previous economy before COVID. You know, we were um, really working to try to um, connect with the hospitality and tourism industry to see if there's something that we can do around work-based experiences because so, it's impossible in many instances to step out of the labor market and not get a wage to train up for the next job so we need to think more creatively as a society about how do we upskill our populations for the next opportunity then backfill those those pre-existing jobs with some of our young people so they get to cut their teeth on the new opportunities um, and now it feels even more imperative that we figure what figure that out what that looks like how do we support people uh, while they upskill at the same time that's so vitally important and I love the point Angie that you make about choice that there is we should offer people the opportunity to decide how they want to earn income, even though we know in some cases the house is on fire uh, and we certainly don't want brown and black residents to feel like they get what's left uh, or are forced into pathways. Um, so Deputy Mayor Smith-Jones, coming back over to you on a similar point. Uh, so the city is, I imagine, going to be growing some of its workforce roles. Uh, Angie mentioned the police force. Are there other opportunities with the city that you see growing um, as we come out of this, this COVID moment, because you're one of the largest employers. Thank you, that's a great question. So to your point about making sure that we take advantage of a crisis and do not let it go to waste, our HR department is actually feverishly working to identify opportunities to, and also really focusing on our incumbent residents, right? Not necessarily attracting from outside, which is a great economic play in general, but how do we work with Employee Indy as a key and strong partner in Ascend Indiana and identifying our current residents and saying, who has the skill set? Going back to, as Commissioner um, 
Fred Payne said, looking at the skill set, not necessarily what the title of the job was, because people have great skill sets that are applicable. And looking across the enterprise of the city and seeing where are there opportunities to kind of look at an entry level position, albeit, but an entry level position that has opportunity to growth and stick to activity, right? So you join the city and you realize what a great opportunity it is to really have a broader view of the entire community, the entire economic system. And so it is a great opportunity to do that. And our HR director is doing just that, looking at working with partners, looking across the enterprise for opportunities for entry level and progression um, positions in um, ensuring that we are strong corporate partners and um, keeping people employed in the city. Thank you. That's so good to know. Uh, before I hand back over to Marshawn, I actually have a super practical question for you, Commissioner Payne. Uh, we've had a question in the chat about whether or not someone who is actively employed but whose hours have been drastically cut uh, is eligible to apply for any of the uh, benefits and insurance trust inherent in the CARES Act? Uh, yes, they are uh, able to apply. It depends on how much money they earn. Uh, for example, the average, the uh, max weekly uh, unemployment insurance benefit in Indiana is three, uh, $390, really up to 390, uh, but up to really 47% of a person's wage. So let's say a person's uh, hours were cut short. And if their hours, uh, the amount of time that they add in their hours and their wages is less than the 390 a week, then they could still be eligible for partial benefits. And if they're eligible for partial benefits, then they will also be eligible for the federal $600 add-on. Great, thank you so much. Marshawn, I'd like to hand back to you for this last round of questions. Interesting um, ideas that you all have, that, that's kind of come up in this conversation is the idea that we have 100,000 jobs out here right now, uh, but we still have a lot of people who are filing for unemployment. And um, what I wanted to kind of get at was middle skill jobs. That's a term that we kind of hear about. Um, can someone explain? what middle skill jobs mean and how do you go about, you know, getting into a middle skill job career in, in part because I think what we're learning is that um, you can get a middle skill job without maybe going to four years of college, but you, but you, you can still make a very good living. And, and so can someone explain that? I'm, I'm just kind of not sure who, who knows that, who wants to take that on. Well, I'll, I'll just okay. um, those, and I, I like to kind of stay away from titles with middle skill, low skill jobs and things like that, because I, I think that they do a disservice to the work that people are performing and it devalues, uh, it sort of devalues what they're doing. But when people reference skills, they really are talking about a job that requires some type of uh, training or certification beyond high school. So I'll give an example of one of the areas that sort of a misnomer, but people end up making a very good living and a good wage on this job. Let's say a welder, a welder certification. A person doesn't need a four-year degree necessarily uh, to be a welder, but they may need some type of welding certification. And from some of the places that I, I've even worked at and the places uh, that are around the state, individuals on with over as a welder could fall into uh, low six figures. So those are, that's a very good example of someone that people would consider that job would be a mid-skill job, uh, but within the workforce itself in those areas that need welders, that's pretty high skill. I think you're on. Um, that, that's an excellent point because you have to have the training as, as a welder. That takes a little bit of time and you want them to know what they're doing. So um, one of the other things that I've, I've observed, I saw the Indies Chamber on MSNBC talking about one of the programs that they were doing. I think uh, Angela Karklich uh, referenced it earlier with the kind of like the rapid response as far as trying to connect people to jobs. 
Um, what other innovations are you seeing from other cities uh, that are, you know, maybe particularly helpful for the black community or the community as a whole as it pertains to this particular moment, either on the demand side or the supply side? And uh, but either one of the Angelas, you could take it on. It's like Angela Carter. I'll, I'll happily chime in and then pass it off to my colleague. Um, so with respect to some of the stopgap solutions that we've put into place here locally. Um, the Indy Chamber, as well as the City of Indianapolis, Employ Indy and Ascend, have been working diligently to put together a more comprehensive systemic plan. So again, we had in the works for the past year plus uh, a singular platform that could be utilized by employers as well as through multi-tenant side supply chains. So looking at higher education institutions, to push their candidates to this platform, but also coming out through our adult ed systems, coming out through our community-based organizations, coming out through K through 12 education. Um, and their you know, systems behind the scenes are not very sexy, but this is really something that could reduce the tension between that matchmaking piece that we're very excited um, and that will be forthcoming. In the interim, you know, the existence of job boards, obviously the state is stepping up um, and we'll be launching a platform here shortly and, and the landing pages. Uh, we have the job board that's on um, rapid response talent hub at the, the chamber and depending on uh, the candidate who the job seeker that comes in if they fall more within a programmatic area that would be an employee in these auspices then they are directed towards us we're not here to recreate the wheel and vice versa if it's a early college professional um, which quite likely given the 48 percent of people who are applying for UI right now who have a bachelor's degree they'd be funneled through a sense platform so it's just again a measure that we're trying to adopt to to quickly help people self-navigate to the opportunities that is predicated on the the idea that these are individuals who can self-navigate right um, other I think more creative solutions that are being uh, deployed for me are utilizing some federal grant monies that are coming down around the humanitarian assistance so some of those temporary employment opportunities where you could couple that with training. Um, that seems like a, a good space for um, our community to play as we look to uh, deal with some of the uh, issues and inequities around food delivery, uh, around transportation, around childcare. Those could be opportunities to subsidize positions so people could have jobs, but then they have a public benefit to the rest of our society too. So. Uh, I'm excited about that and, and more to come, obviously, in that space. Wanted to add in that. Did you have anything you wanted to add to that, Angela Smith Jones, Deputy Mayor? So I, I was, I knew Angie was the perfect uh, person to start with that answer. And I will say that as I continue to look around the country, I really feel like Indianapolis is so uniquely positioned because we have such strong leaders and we are known as a community who really collaborates. And as Angie indicated, we've already been working on that foundation. And so now we have leaders who are able to step up and say, oh, here's a stopgap to help us as we continue to navigate along this path that we're already paving together right so I just I really do think we're moving at lightning speed and being very creative we're not trying to create perfection right now but we are cognizant of keeping those in, that are most vulnerable in our community in mind as we're moving forward to make sure that at the end of the day we have a system that really works for all and incorporates all so it sounds like um, we have a lot of things in the works. I know that there is uh, discussion even at the federal level of, um, uh, I guess, CARES Act number three, two or three. Um, the House just passed some legislation, so it'll be interesting to see what federal dollars come from that. Um, at this point, I'd like to turn it back over to Molly uh, to see if she had any other additional questions. Sure, uh, this is to the entire panel. So you have something of a captive audience. You have people from Indianapolis, Baltimore, LA, Fort Wayne, just kind of all over listening to you right now. And some of those folks have expressed on the back channel that they are currently unemployed. What is your word of, you know, Commissioner Payne, you off, offered it a little bit, but what is your word to anyone who's listening right now that is feeling like that promise has been broken? 
Uh, so this is a personal message and New York City, someone just chimed in. So you've, you've really got a, a wide audience. Um, Angie Karklich, I'll start with you. What would you say one-on-one -on -one to some of the workers in our back channel right now? Well, I think that um, it was spoken to earlier, but like you're not alone and that this is a time if you are able to draw down, um, whether it's the pandemic unemployment insurance or other unemployment insurance benefits, access those to give a little bit of breathing room, if possible, to start thinking about what's next, right? Um, and using the resources that are available, you know, we are seeing a huge uptick in individuals uh, participating in online workshops to revamp their resume. Uh, that's something that, you know, the personal ownership will have, to, you know, I would say go for that, but that also, you know what I mean? Understand what resources are available there, understand where the job boards are, um, and then, you know, we are um, starting to open up by calendar appointments, even one-on-one -on -one conversation with career navigators. And that's probably something that uh, a lot of our funding uh, to support the human capital in this space is tied to the unemployment rate. So uh, it's odd because obviously we know that there's such an increase in demand and need for these services, but we don't necessarily, as we sit here today, have the funding resources to staff up to be able to meet that demand. So we are working diligently with the city as well as with the state and the federal government to see what we can do to, to manage cash flow so that we don't reduce our staff, so that we actually start increasing and bringing new people on board who can have that one-on-one -on -one conversation. Because frankly, Molly, I'm not the best person to talk to one-on-one -on -one about how, how do we pivot to the, but I've got an amazing staff, an amazing team who are much more knowledgeable than myself. And, uh, stand at the ready and that that would uh, be true across this country for all workforce development boards I just uh, would be remiss in the moment to not indicate that you know there is just a challenge right now with the the fiscal underpinnings of this system to meet what is now just in such an increased demand for services and delivery sure and that is a just louder for the funders on the call I know we've got some people in the audience um, deputy mayor what would you add Thank you. I would say the most important thing is to keep hope. I know it is very discouraging and disheartening right now, but try to keep hope. Look at every opportunity and go for it. Do not tell yourself no. You let somebody else tell you no. So if you have a united way, if you have a community investment fund, if you have a workforce investment board, absolutely find every opportunity you can. Talk to friends um, and apply for every type of financial support you can get. Secondarily, I know I sound like a city person, but you have to complete your census because if you're not completing your census, none of us can get this data that helps inform how we move forward with funding and training um, and then opportunities. So going forward, we will know that you are here and that you need this kind of help. So please complete your census no matter what. And then the other thing is to really take an opportunity. This is a time when you're at home by yourself with your family to look inside. What are some of your goals and hopes and aspirations that were taken from you in the past? And now you can shift and say, you know what? Uh, people keep talking about coding. What is that? Well, if you can use your iPhone, if you can use your iPad, you are already a coder. If you play Xbox or PlayStation, you are a coder. So you have some great gift skill sets and talents that you nobody told you you had or that you've been wasting because you didn't know to use them. Now's the time to look inside and say, here's my ultimate goal in a career or company ownership you see that the supply chain is going to shift and you have a talent that's going to fill that gap going forward. So take this time, look for partnerships where you can get online training, find a program or certification where you can start to really advance your income and your training and experience. Um, and the last thing is just keep hope, do your census, please, because that really impacts every local government, every state government, and the federal government funding to really, so that we never have this kind of situation again. Thank you so much. And I would point that in the chat, my2020census.gov, if you haven't filled it out yet. Uh, Commissioner Payne, what would you add? Uh, I'll add one thing about the census. Uh, right now, we are, we will be holding a virtual job fair for census workers. There will be, there are 700 census jobs that will be open here in uh, Indiana uh, coming up. So that is a good opportunity for people who want something to do temporarily 
Uh, we know it's not a, 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 a job that's going to last for a long time, but it is something temporarily that people can do. And we'll have a virtual job fair for those who are interested in that. Now, more specifically to your question, I'll, I'll talk about the word opportunity. And I think it, it wraps up uh, what both uh, the Deputy Mayor and, and President uh, and CEO uh, Angie Carr Click said, uh, really, this is a time for us to take advantage of some opportunity of some time that we didn't ask for. We didn't ask for this time at home. We didn't ask for it. But since we have it, let's take advantage of it and let's use it as an opportunity to one, take advantage of the resources. So first, let's take an inventory of the resources that may be, be available. Secondly, when we, take when we look at those resources and we look at that inventory, align what we want to do with the resources that are available and then aggressively pursue those. And I'd be remiss right now, and I wouldn't be doing uh, any of us uh, any service uh, if I didn't talk a little bit about our unemployment insurance system and as it exists right now. As we mentioned before, there are opportunities that are available for people uh, who were not otherwise uh, contemplated under our unemployment insurance system. Every state in the country right now uh, has experienced this extremely high volume of people filing for unemployment insurance benefits. We knock out probably about 85% of claims within 21 days. But that small percentage of claims, that 15% or 10 or 15%, is taken beyond 21 days. So there may be a little bit of frustration because a person may say, well, hey, I tried to apply and I haven't uh, gotten my benefits yet. Um, each person who's eligible will end up getting their benefits. Uh, and I've used the word patient for a while now because I do want people to understand the realities of the system. And this isn't uh, Indiana or any other state specific. It is around the country because our systems were not designed to handle this volume this quickly. But we have beefed up our staff and we've beefed up the technology to make sure that we have more throughput. So take advantage of it. But if you have already applied and you have not started receiving benefits yet, your benefits, if you're eligible, they will be there. And I know that that's a part of the added stress that people are having right now at home. And I didn't want to take this and miss this opportunity uh, to address that because we know that that reality exists. But now having said that, make sure that you take advantage of it, but also make sure that you're taking advantage of the other opportunities that are there as well. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Uh, here in the last minute or so, I wanna thank everyone who has attended. If we didn't get to your question, uh, we, we do try to address those even after the event, so you can look forward to a follow-up from me. I really wanna thank our panelists, a uh, phenomenal job so open, uh, so authentic today, but also I want to thank you because your job is not easy right now. Uh, the three of you have three of the harder jobs uh, in this unprecedented time, and uh, I really do appreciate it. Uh, before I hand over to Marshawn to say goodbye, I want to thank the Indianapolis Recorder. I want to thank our partners at WFYI. I want to encourage everyone in the chat to reach out to New America. You can reach me personally at martin at newamerica.org. If you have ideas for how certain delivery systems or policies that you've encountered in trying to obtain your benefits or find work uh, could be improved. And that's uh, work that we do, research that we do, and then share with folks like the ones you see on your screen today. So thank you again for joining us. A video of this will be made available, as will a list of resources shared by our panelists. Marshawn, I'd like to turn to you to close this out. So for over 125 years, the Indianapolis Recorder has been working to prepare a conscious community. Uh, one of the things we appreciate is that on the other side of a challenge is opportunity. And as we've talked today, we have been empowered with resources and information, mostly understanding that you're not alone if you have experienced unemployment right now, but that there is an opportunity to take control and, and figure out what direction you want to go and, and how you want to reshape your career. And so with that, we look forward to all of the opportunities that you all will be taking advantage of in the future. And um, thank you, and we'll see you probably in another week or so. Thanks.